thank you everyone for uh, making this event possible and particularly thank you to you Yanis for taking the time and uh, we're very very grateful and happy uh, to see you among us. Uh, thank you for agreeing to be with us Yanis. The next set of questions are born out of the complex interests of our community of uh, faculty members and students. And given the wide scope of your writing and activity, as Adam has just described, we will be able only to scratch uh, the surface, but we will do our best to cover as much as we can for our community that cares about Palestine, black history, gender rights, workers' rights, ecology, and decolonization, among many other issues. While I wanted to have a structured discussion with you, beginning with the academia, moving to politics, uh, which I hope we still will have, we cannot ignore what happens in Palestine right now. A criminal Israeli prime minister who tries to avoid jail pursues a provocative action against the holiest place for Islam in Palestine and the third holiest uh, place for Muslims all over the world in order to ignite a conflict that would retain him in power. In order to do so, he aligned himself with the right wing in Israel which today dominates Israeli politics and whose agenda is to Judaize fully Jerusalem and the West Bank through means of another catastrophe or Nakba. Brave Palestinian youth were able to throat some parts of this plan, defending the homes of the people of Sheikh Jarrah and the sacred Al-Aqsa Mosque. It was clear to everyone that the Hamas in Gaza would not remain idle against such a provocation and aggression nor will large segments of the Palestinian people who have been living for decades under harsh colonization, brutal occupation, and subject to incremental ethnic cleansing. We might be in the thoughts of a third uprising, a third intifada, which includes large segments of the forgotten Palestinians inside Israel, living in unrecognized villages which are refused basic infrastructure from the state or in overcrowded towns this allowed to expand under the apartheid laws of land regime of the land regime in Israel, with high levels of unemployment as a result of the de facto apartheid imposed by Israel on its Palestinian citizens. The Palestinian Authority is helpless, the Arab regime seek normalization rather than commitment, and the West as always is silent, and I have not heard much from the Muslim world as yet. What can we do right now to you, Ma, to, in your opinion? Should we strengthen our support for the boycott and divestment sanction movement? Should we ask for sanctions by governments? What is the next step in our solidarity with the oppressed people of Palestine, given the unfolding reality in front of our eyes in the last 48 to 72 hours? So I, don't, I hope you don't mind we start with this and we'll, then we'll move to more uh, 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 historical and theoretical questions. Ilan, thank you very much for the, not just the invitation, but for everything you've done over the, the years, the decades, uh, to illuminate what is going on and to help me personally, me personally, understand what's going on. You asked me what should we do, and you listed a number of things. The answer, of course, is all of the above. We need to uh, take this struggle for... Um, uh, primarily informing people and also calling upon governments, shaming governments into taking a position and not to pretend that this is uh, some conflict between two equals, that uh, the rest of the world has the right to uh, look upon dispassionately. I remember, yeah, I, let me just state this for the record, I've been following your writings for many, many years. And um, I remember something you wrote, I think it was, um, 12 years ago, something like that. Uh, I, I, I kept a note of it because I, I have a, a long uh, archive on uh, the Palestinian question because uh, as, was it Edward Said who said that? I'm not sure whether it was Ed Said or someone said that um, until the Palestinians liberate themselves, uh, Europeans and Americans are not going to liberate ourselves. Uh, and I think you had written that um, and I'll, I'll just quote that because I've got it here on my screen. It seems that even the most horrendous crimes, such as the genocide in Gaza, are treated as desperate events, 
unconnected to anything that happened in the past and not associated with any ideology of, or system. This is, you know, if, you, if you watch the BBC today or listen to Radio 4 or the World Service, it's exactly that. There is some factual reporting that so many uh, rockets were fired from Gaza and uh, so many bombs landed in Gaza and this building was demolished and so many people died and so many... But it is as if, to quote again your uh, brilliant words, it is as if the whole thing is unconnected to anything that happened in the past and not associated with, the, with any system or ideology. Uh, that is uh, racism in action. That's what it is. Uh, the moment you take uh, just the figures and, uh, of a conflict and you take it out of the context of effectively uh, an ongoing project that has been going on now for decades of um, uh, ethnic cleansing, of pushing a native people off its land in order to uh, effectively wipe the slate clean. Um, the moment you are allowed to get away without any comments on this underlying project that is focusing only the events, uh, that is when you become complicit to the crime that is being perpetrated. Um, and, and you can see that in, in Germany, for instance, you know, which is a, a country that uh, um, is populated by people who are desperately trying to escape uh, a dismal past by being politically correct. You can see that today uh, there is zero information regarding what's going on. How did it start? It? You know, nobody in Germany that I know of, very decent, very good people, knows uh, that um, this, uh, la this latest cycle of violence, of conflict, uh, began when um, dozens of families were threatened with expulsion from their home and the dynamitizing of their, um, of their buildings. Uh, so, uh, we need to do <laughs> so much at every different front. But let me now wear my Greek political hat just for a, for a moment uh, to convey to you and to relate to you my desperation, my deep sense of shame and um, foreboding. You will recall and it was mentioned in my introduction that in 2015 um, I became part of the government here in Greece. It was the, gov the most progressive government probably in Europe. We were the result of uh, massive demonstrations in 2011, you know, the equivalent of Occupy Wall Street, the equivalent of the Indignados in Spain. A broad coalition of progressives gave rise to a movement that in the end took a small party from of the left, of the former Eurocommunist left, from 4% and gave us 40%. And we stormed the citadels of power. We became the government. Part of our agenda was uh, solidarity with the people of Palestine. Anti-racism and um, fighting every form of racism, including, of course, primarily anti-Semitism, but solidarity with the people of Palestine. For six months, we put up a tremendous struggle. Uh, the Greek people rose to the occasion and very courageously increased their support of us from 40% to 60%. And on that night, my then comrade and prime minister surrendered to the powers that be. The powers that be were the representatives of the international oligarchy, the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank, the European Commission. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because you know, one surrender brings on another. Within weeks after my resignation, after that surrender of our government, which was supported by people who had shown a remarkable solidarity to the Palestinians since the 1920, uh, 1980s and before, Yasser Arafat, when he escaped Beirut, if you remember back in the uh, early 1980s, uh, found refuge in a very welcoming Greece. Um, that party 
that government, within weeks of this, their surrender to the international oligarchy, were hobnobbing with Netanyahu. They forged an alliance with Netanyahu's government and they planned together to dominate the Eastern Mediterranean through a series of aggressive moves to drill the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea and to construct uh, gas pipelines, all in association, in uh, very close association and collaboration with ExxonMobil, with uh, the French Total, and of course, with Donald Trump. That degeneration of a political progressive government movement uh, in whose DNA support of the Palestinian people was um, embedded so quickly into a staunch ally of Netanyahu. I have to tell you that this hurt me even more than the actual surrender to the Troika. Because, you know, deep down, we all want to give our comrades, uh, even when we disagree and fall out with them, we want to give them the benefit of the doubt. So there's no doubt that we were under immense pressure from international finance to buckle. Now, I don't think we should have ever considered buckling, especially after that tremendous uh, victory in the referendum of the 5th of July 2015. But, you know, in the end, something at the back of my mind wanted to forgive, to give a good cause to my comrades, Tsipras, for instance, for surrendering. But the sight of him hobnobbing with Netanyahu, the manner in which the so-called party of the radical left <laughs> immediately forgot its solidarity to the Palestinian people. Let me give you an example. Now they're in opposition. Of course, the Greek people have a tendency quite rationally and wisely to um, punish every party that betrays uh, its, um, its commitments. So now we have a very right-wing government that um, overthrew the, that series of government. Now, they are still, they're in opposition now. They're still supporting this treaty with Netanyahu. I stand in, on the floor of our parliament and I address political parties and I'm saying, is this not the time at least to recognize the Palestinian authorities as a state? If, even though I am of the belief that now this is, the, the two-state solution is, is gone and passed, and I think like you, I support one democratic state for everyone. Um, I challenge them to say what they will do in order to restore Greek support for the Palestinian people. And they look at me, even the, the comrades of the left, they look at me in the eye and they keep silent. And as we know, uh, this kind of silence is um, the greatest uh, ally of the crime that is being perpetrated. That silence is guilty that attempt to take an equal position, or actually not an equidistant position, not to take sides, is simply a vote of confidence for Mr. Netanyahu. So um, our struggle here in Greece is to reignite the support for anti-racism everywhere in the world, uh, for fighting anti-Semitism, while at the same time uh, bringing to in the court of public opinion, uh, the news of the apartheid policies that are being practiced in Israel. I'm very pleased that the that Human Rights Watch delivered their report on apartheid. I, um, I, I feel personally indebted to Bezalem and to other comrades in Israel for bringing up the question of apartheid. This is what we're trying to do as DiEM25, in Germany in particular, where you are almost immediately um, silenced as an anti-Semite if you talk about apartheid. So if you are an anti-racist, you are immediately assumed that to be an anti-racist means that you are an anti-Semite. Uh, we, we need to fight at many different fronts, at all levels, simultaneously, ceaselessly, night and day. Sorry for, being, for taking so long to answer, but this really hurts. Uh, because you know, this place here used to be at least when it came to support and solidarity for the Palestinian people, quite solid. We are no longer solid. We've been corrupted by the oligarchy and by the promise of security alliances against Turkey, as if this is going to provide security to anyone. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm so glad you're saying it, because uh, as, as you know, uh, 
you know, you'll ask uh, the Israeli foreign minister or foreign ministry diplomats, which are the countries in Europe which they find are the best allies of Israel at this moment in time. Unfortunately, Greece would be one of them. Uh, uh, but I mm-hmm. think, uh, uh, as I n- noticed myself when I come to talk in Athens and Greece, uh, the civil society is very much be still pro-Palestinian. And in that respect, uh, we still have hope that also politics from above in Greece would uh, return to what they used to be because Palestinians need every possible ally, definitely in the Mediterranean uh, and in places in Southern Europe, which are so near to Palestine and the struggle of the Palestinians. Uh, so Yanis, uh, we'll move discreetly from topic to topic as much as our time would allow us. I think all these topics are connected by your activism and writing uh, and thinking. So uh, even if they seem discreet, uh, they do have a lot in common. Uh, before I thought we will begin with the crisis in Palestine, I, I hope to actually start with the academia, which is the place uh, most of us are coming from uh, uh, tonight. And I know that uh, at the height of your political career, uh, you would sneak back to uh, the acad- academia whenever you could and examine in many ways the relevance of uh, your former home, uh, which was the Department of Economics or, or the queen of the social sciences, uh, the discipline of economics. Um, and you, you sort of would look at it and to see how much is it still relevant to the reality that you experience yourself both as an activist and as a politician? Uh, so it seems that ambiguously, while you were happy to be in a comfort zone, at the same time revisiting your so-called sanctuary, filled you, if I understood correctly from what I read uh, and, and heard, filled you with frustration. The economics, the discipline, seemed still to be decoupled uh, from uh, the economic and political realities of our world. Uh, it seems that economic departments in the UK, in the US, and in many other places, as you commented several times, underrate the importance of the history of economics, are fascinated with purist models examined in laboratories where space, time, and as you rightly comment, debt, are disturbing variants that will not be factored in in order not to undermine the pretended predicative power of economic theory. The fact that these experts teaching economics have dismally failed again and again in providing any valid prediction, in particular on the eve of big spasms in the capitalist system, mainly by disregarding ethical and ideological consideration, which are painted as disruptive to scientific research, uh, did not seem to change much in the way economics is taught or researched until today. As a historian who is aware that I can easily argue and counter argue with myself and others with the very same facts, realizing that the different versions of narratives would stem primarily from external factors, such as my moral positionality today, I can fully empathize with the humble recognition that economics, like the discipline of history, are not sciences. While both disciplines have crucial elements of empirical study, facts, methods, and models, the end product, prediction or historical analysis, is the outcome of non-scientific elements, but as much as it is of the empirical evidence gathered from the laboratory or the archive. This is a position which is not easy to adopt. It invites politics, ideology, ethics, and morality to enter our world of scholarly work through the main door and not claim to be successfully blocked in the gates of the university by academic apparatuses. Such an invitation is still regarded as a heresy in many academic circles, either because people believe it is still possible to be objective, or because such a stance could dry our funding for our research from governments unwilling to support research contradicting their policies, or corporations reluctant to fund research that undermines their interests. Am I presenting a position that you can identify with And if you do, do you see any hope for the discourse of plurality rather than the discourse of proof as being able to guide future research and teaching in economics in particular? Uh, Do you see any change in the way economics is being taught, research, and what kind of change would you like to see still going on uh, in the part of academia that deals with a 
economy, political autonomy, and so many other issues that you were uh, uh, familiar with, both as a politician, as a theorist, and as an activist. Absolutely, I uh, wholeheartedly endorse uh, your take on economics. Uh, I would take it further, and I will in a minute. Uh, do I see any prospect of um, economics, uh, uh, academic economics, becoming more civilized <laughs> and uh, more relevant? No, I don't, and I'll explain that as well. Uh, when it comes to what should be done, how should economics be taught? I'll answer that question first and then go to the beginning to explain why we are in the state uh, of play that we find ourselves in. What I think we should do, and this is what I try to do uh, in uh, uh, undergraduate teaching, year one, semester one, which is I think is so important, uh, to get them when they are young, because if you don't, then uh, <laughs> mechanism will, uh, is to, uh, to teach um, the parallel evolution of capitalism and of our ideas about capitalism, to teach those two as two parallel paths, to explain, you know, why did Adam Smith write The Wealth of Nations in 1776? Why wasn't it written 100 years before? So you, you, you start talking about the uh, historical necessity of throwing light on events that seemed absolutely indecipherable. Like, for instance, the decoupling of political power from economic power. So, suddenly, some people had huge power economically, but they didn't have any political power. The merchants, the in first industrialists. Uh, then to explain, uh, you know, why did economists like David Ricardo suddenly turn against landowners, even though they were themselves the landowners? the invention of the concept of economic grant. Why did Karl Marx become Karl Marx? Why was he writing about um, you know, the fluctuations of the economic cycle in uh, volume one? Uh, and finally, and most importantly, why was it that economics became transformed from a holistic, organic approach, like the one you described, where you had it didn't matter whether you were left-wing, right-wing, in favor of free market, capitalism, or against, whether you were, in other words, John Stuart Mill, or you were Karl Marx. Uh, you approached the big questions organically. What is it that gives rise to wealth creation? Uh, how is income distributed? Uh, what is the mechanism by which competition leads to innovation? Innovation leads to capital accumulation. Capital accumulation leads to investment. Investment le leads to technical progress. Technical progress leads to social uh, raptures and so on. These were the big questions that the first economists, who didn't actually call themselves economists, tackled. But then at some point in the middle of the 19th century, let's say 1860s onwards, suddenly you get a species of economics that is completely and utterly different, which is mathematized, which is treating capitalism as if it is uh, a phenomenon very much like um, uh, the motion of the planets in a Newtonian sense, whereby a set of equations, a system of equations, uh, needs to be solved so that you can work, that, work out how the whole thing um, uh, works, operates, functions. And suddenly you have this professionalization, that the, the academic economist embedded in the great universities in Europe, um, suddenly speak a language that you know, Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill and David Ricard and Karl Marx and the rest would not recognize and would have no time for. Why, why, why did that happen? The sociology of the profession, in other words. Um, to cut a very, very long story short, let me say that I have been referring to economics as a most peculiar failure. By that, what I allude to is um, a very interesting inverse Darwinist, Darwinian process. In nature, according to Darwin, you have um, mutations and um, a process of adaptation that favors the capacity um, to remain in tune with one's environment. In economics, you have exactly the opposite. The less relevant the model is to really exist in capitalism, 
the greater the academic power it imparts to the economist who comes up with that kind of theory. Now, how can that possibly be the case? Well, the greatest um, utility uh, for economic, academic economics comes from appearing as the physics of the social sciences, the queen of the social sciences, as you put it, to gain an upper hand vis-a-vis -vis anthropology, sociology, so on. Economists found it very profitable to be able to present themselves as the scientists of, of society, to make the distinction between positive economics and normative economics, a description of how, the, of, cap, the capital, of how capitalism works, which is scientific, independent, in the same way that you can have a Nazi uh, physicist, like we did in the 1930s and 40s, and a communist physicist or a you know, liberal democrat physicist, uh, they can have huge differences of opinion when it comes to politics and ethics. But when it comes to physics, you know, they, they agree because, you know, the, the, the way atoms work is independent of our ideas about society and humanity. Uh, and economists got a lot of power out of pretending that, academic economists, that they could uh, distinguish and separate uh, the science of economics, the description of how capitalism works, from our ideas of how society should be structured, positive normative. Now, if you're going to be a scientist of society, and this is what they try to do, uh, you need to emulate the methods of science. Now, what were the methods of science that succeeded in imparting so much uh, discursive power to Isaac Newton? Uh, the method where you begin with axioms that could be right or wrong, like, for instance, the axiom of energy conservation, the principle of energy conservation, Newton's idea that energy does not dissipate into nothing, it is not born out of nothing, but it's constant and simply changes form from kinetic to thermal and so on, uh, which you know, he had no evidence that that was so, it was a, an axiom. Then working out the mathematical relationship between velocity, acceleration, mass, and so on, that would be true, would hold if the axiom was right, and then going to the laboratory to do the empirical testing, if the empirics did not contradict the mathematical form of the theory, then the axiom was supported. That's how physics works. So that the economists who became the first professors of economics, the first recognized scientists of society, emulated that process. So they started again with axioms. Now, if you're going to have a universal axiom about how everything works, like you know the, the principle of energy conservation, which applies um, in Britain, in Palestine, on Mars, in the um, distant parts of the galaxy, if you're going to emulate that universality, you have to come up with a very general proposition. Like, for instance, you know, humans do whatever maximizes their utility function. Okay. Now, that's <laughs> a tautology, really. Um, it's not particularly insightful, unlike the principle of energy conservation. From that, you get mathematical equations describing human behavior, consumer choice, producer choice, and so on. And you end up with a system of equations. Now, I guarantee you that if you give a child, a high school teacher, a teacher, a student, pupil, a system of two equations and two unknowns. They have an urge, unless they are extremely bored with, with algebra, right, to actually solve it, to see, you know, what's X and what's Y. We have a tendency, if we see a, a simple equation um, with one unknown, to actually solve it and find the value of X. Uh, and there's a kind of um, sense of achievement when you actually solve it. So a system of equations immediately creates um, a psychological urge for us to solve it. Now, the problem with the systems of equations that capture the capitalist economy, equations that have variables such as prices of things, including the price of labor, which is the wage, the price of money, which is the interest rate, and quantities, you know, tons of tomatoes, uh, potatoes, uh, um, the quantity of money that is being demanded for investment purposes, oh, these are quantities. So you have equations, demand and supply, the one is one side of the equation, supply is the other, to equilibrate, can we find the prices and quantities that solve this? In other words, can there be an equilibrium in the capitalist market that would make everybody as well off as they can be without making anyone else worse off? This is the principle of optimality, of efficiency. Now, the problem is that to solve any such system of equations, you have to make assumptions 
which spectacularly push you away from reality. Let me give you an example of an assumption that you have to make. There is no time, and there can be no time. <laughs> because the moment you allow time to sip in, then changes are being made that make the system of equations impossible to solve. So you make all these assumptions because, let's face it, uh, you have PhD students. In, if you were an economist, an economics professor, your PhD student, you would only be able to get the thesis defended properly as an economic theorist. If after having specified a system of equations that captures the market for oil, the market for um, whatever, or all markets as one, at once at general equilibrium, the only way uh, positing a system of equations is not enough. They have to solve it. By having this need to solve it, and institutionally, otherwise they don't get their the PhD, they don't get published in the good journals once they have their PhD, they don't get their lectureship once they get published, uh, there is an institutional drive uh, to close the model, to solve the system, to introduce, in other words, assumptions, axioms, that remove this whole system of thought totally from really existing capitalism. Really existing capitalism cannot survive without time, for instance, right? So they need to remove that, that essential aspect of reality, of a capitalist reality, in order to create a model of capitalism. That's why I call it the most, uh, a most peculiar failure. The more successful they are at distancing the economics from capitalism, the greater their capacity to get tenure in the good schools. And once they get tenure, then they get very cushy um, research projects and commissions from financial, the financial sector. And what fascinated me back in the 1980s and uh, the 1990s when I was studying all that was that the very same unrealistic axioms that are necessary in order to complete one's <laughs> academic career were the very same assumptions that financiers used in order to close their financial models, the models behind the construction by Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs of the derivatives that blew up in 2008. So, the, the more anti-scientific, in a sense, you were in order to solve your scientific mathematical models, the more you distance yourself from really existing capitalism, the more successful you became as an economist, the more money you brought to the economics department, the greater the opportunities of getting a Nobel Prize in economics. That is a most peculiar failure. It is as if there is a whole system of incentives designed, as if designed, I'm not saying that there's a conspiracy, nobody designed them, it's a priesthood that reproduces itself through those particular practices, practices that lead to the uh, permanent and unbridgeable, irreversible disengagement between economic theory and really existing capitalism. Now, is it any wonder that when 2008 happened, the Queen of England um, asked uh, the members of the Royal Economic Society, why didn't you see it coming? And they had no idea. It took them days to come up with a groveling letter of apology saying, you know, our models couldn't tell us. Of course they couldn't tell you, because they were designed not to tell you. They were designed not to have anything interesting, useful, relevant to say about really existing capitalism. And this is why you were powerful. So it was, you see, there's a fundamental and profound difference between saying that you know, economics failed from saying what I'm saying, which is a very, uh, specific charge, if you want, that economics is designed to acquire discursive power in our academy and in society at large in proportion to its incapacity to understand capitalism. And that is why I think that the solvent, the answer, is what I said at the beginning. Teach the models, but in the same way that you need to teach theology. In the same way you explain, for instance, you know, what happened um, to precipitate the schism between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, and therefore to bring on the Crusades that destroyed Palestine. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the disagreements amongst theologians regarding filioque and whether the Holy Spirit um, is moved about by the will of God or uh, God and Christ and so on, you need to embed this in a, a, a history of the politics, the economics, the trade clashes between the Eastern and Western parts of the former Roman Empire or the Roman Empire, and to embed a theory 
about theories with a historical account of um, how the world we live in emerged. You are muted, I think, Ilan. Sorry. Yes, uh, I think the last person who was still teaching uh, as a main course or main module, as we call it in Britain, of history of economics was was retired from Cambridge University about a few years ago. So definitely history is not being part of the curriculum in any way or form. Uh, but I think gotcha. there's a good uh, example, current example to what you were talking about. And, and maybe that's a good uh, uh, moment to move to, to a related uh, notion uh, or a related issue that uh, we should discuss. A and this is the, the situation that emerged in the world, both the economic and political world uh, under the pandemic, under COVID-19. And, and in a dystopian mood, some of us fear that uh, what you call rightly techno-feudalism uh, uh, is, is collaborating now, or even maybe replaced or uh, uh, augmented by uh, bio, bio feudalism, pharmaceutical giants developing research with the taxpayers' money, producing and selling solutions paid by taxpayers' money in the name of public health and under the panic of, uh, uh, of the pandemic. Uh, there and other corporation shares rise in the stock exchange market, while the number of unemployed, working and middle class people is unprecedented all over the world. The same is true about companies that produce surveillance uh, products. Now, what is your antidote that might help see the pandemic reality as a moment of hope rather than despairing about it? Uh, an optimism that would maybe justify the question mark that you have put on your on the title of your wonderful book uh, and the weak suffer what they must you have put there uh, a, a question mark uh, so maybe the weak don't have don't have to suffer uh, in a way so do you see a, a ray of hope out of the the reality of the pandemic uh, in terms of world economy global economy and uh, the near and maybe the more distant future in this respect. Always. I always see hope wherever I look. I'm not optimistic <laughs> because optimism is the poor cousin of hope, but I always see hope, whether it was a 2008 crisis, uh, uh, this pandemic. Uh, hope is everywhere, wherever you look. Uh, when you look uh, into the, the eyes of the young uh, who are resisting climate change, uh, uh, trade unionists um, rising up in New Jersey, in Bangladesh, uh, against Amazon's uh, working conditions. Uh, hope is always there. But I think the, the you know, just, just to answer your question directly, uh, the antidote to this globalized techno-feudalism, and by the way, the biofeudalism is part of techno-feudalism. I'm not simply talking about digital technologies. I'm talking about the capacity of uh, high-tech whether it's bio high tech or digital high tech, uh, to aid and abet the creation of a, 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 a new kind of feudalism. I'll come back to this in a moment, but the antidote is democratic international movements, internationalist democratic movements. Uh, some of us have, um, have come together, um, actually it was a year ago today, um, in what we call the progressive international. Uh, Bernie Sanders and I, uh, kick-started that in November 2018 in Vermont. Uh, now it has been taken over by um, movements uh, from around the world, from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America, from the United States, uh, here in Europe. Uh, and for me, that is a great source of hope. Uh, because let's face it, Ilan, you know, the bankers and the fascists um, have internationalized. They understand very well. They understand fully the power of solidarity. They are very solidaristic to one another. You know, Modi, Salvini, Le Pen, Trump, Bolsonaro, uh, Netanyahu, they love each other, they show it. And they are <laughs> completely uh, solidaristic to one another. Similarly, if you go to Davos, not that you should or you will, um, I'm sure you will find uh, people sitting around the table, bankers from different countries, from England, from Switzerland, from Thailand, from Nigeria, there's no racism, there's no discrimination amongst them. They're like brothers and sisters. 
Well, isn't the time that internationalists do the same thing? Just one, word, one um, brief explanation of the term technophilialism, the way I understand it. You see, in, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, the rosy view of capitalism as a competitive uh, village-like marketplace uh, in which the baker, uh, the brewer and the butcher, these are the three iconic figures featuring in Adam Smith's uh, account of free markets, uh, had already been sidelined by the large corporations, the network firms of um, Thomas Edison, of Henry Ford and so on. Uh, we had already moved to what Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin and others refer to as monopoly capitalism. But what happened in 2008 uh, was a structural shift away from that. Some friends of mine even, uh, colleagues of mine, comrades of mine, um, are somehow puzzled by my insistence that uh, 2008 was for capitalism, that which for um, that for which 1991 did to the Soviet Union in satellites. It's the end of capitalism, 2008, uh, in the sense that we are no longer after 2008 in a standard monopoly capitalist environment. Walmart, Henry Ford, those were the examples of the monopolists that um, regrouped after the end of Bretton Woods, after the end of the Second World War, and became what John Kenneth Galbraith referred to as the techno-structure. That is um, a kind of central planning uh, by a cartel of industrialists. That was monopoly capitalism. Um, and this was still capitalist. It was monopolist capitalist, but still capitalist in the sense that the basic force driving the world economy was surplus value, to put it in Marxian terms. It was profits realized from uh, the labor process, from the disparity between the value of labor going inside commodities and services by workers and the value of their labor time wages. So the standard process of capital accumulation, of capitalist production yielding profits, profits then driving the system, that was maintained even during the phase of monopoly capitalism that people like Paul Sweezy and um, my great friends from Monthly Review in New York were so beautifully mapping out. Uh, but since 2008, that has ended. Since 2008, when under the weight of the hubris of the financial sector, the, the whole thing blew up, central banks came in and started pumping whole rivers of cash into the capitalist framework. They wanted to, to make this temporary, to refloat the financial sector, but in refloating the financial sector, practicing what I call socialism for the financiers and huge austerity for everyone else across the world. What they did was to zombify corporations and banks. And effectively, you've got corporations that are doing really very well financially, but whose financial health is not related to it, their profitability. If you look, especially now, and this has been exacerbated hugely in the pandemic, but it's not new. The pandemic has simply exacerbated, it has accelerated, it has, it's deepened this process, but the process began in 2009 under Obama. And the, 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 the very successful attempt to refloat the financial sector. The process is now very straightforward. Central banks, print oodles of cash. They give it to the private banks. The private banks are not going to lend it to the little people, to the small businesses, because universal austerity means that the little people cannot be relied upon to repay it. So what the bankers do is they pick up the phone and they call a large conglomerate like Apple in the United States, like Volkswagen in Germany, Alstom in France and so on. And they say, look, I have a few billion that the central bank has given me, they've given it to me at negative interest rate, so I can give it to you for free, zero interest rate, and I still make a profit. Uh, do you want it? Now, these corporations, because they can, they, they can also see that the little people cannot buy their stuff, are not investing 
They are sitting on a pile of savings. For the first time in the history of capitalism, corporations have savings. Corporations are not meant to have savings. Households are, men, have, are meant to save, and corporations are meant to borrow, to invest. So when you see that Apple has 200 billion <laughs> US dollars as a, saving, a savings pile, similarly in Europe, you think, my God, something's going, something's going wrong here. So the reason why they are not safe, they are not investing it is because they fear that the little, the little people, because of austerity, universal austerity, will not be able to buy their stuff. So when Deutsche Bank or Bank of America, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, Societe Generale, call them up and say, you know, I have a few billion for free, do you want it? They say, okay, bring it on. But they're not going to use it to save, to, sorry, to, you know, to invest. What they do is they take this money and immediately go to the stock exchange where they buy their own shares. So Apple takes central bank money via the, the private bank and purchases Apple shares. Volkswagen purchases Volkswagen shares. So the share markets go up. You've got this remarkable performance. Have you noticed that during the pandemic, when everything shut down, everything shut down, you know, prof profits went to, to, to deeply into the red everywhere in the world, and yet the financial markets were going gangbusters. Now, why? Because of the process I am describing. On the 12th of August 2020, there was a remarkable phenomenon in the city of London. 9.05 in the morning, I, I, I mark the times as well. 9.05 in the morning, we had the news, uh, unprecedented news, and um, uh, news that had not been predicted by the markets, that the UK's national income, GDP, fell by more than 20% for the first time in the history of British capitalism. That was way above what the markets had expected. 15 minutes later, the London Stock Exchange goes up, which means that the financiers thought, oh, that's good news. Now, how can it be good news? <laughs> when uh, you, you can't even claim that this was all factored in. It was not factored in. They were surprised. The reason why the London Stock Exchange went up was because they were surprised by how bad things were. Now, does this make sense? Yes, it does. Because they understood that we don't live in capitalism anymore, that we live in a world which is sitting on a capitalist world, which is now being fed by state money produced by the central banks. And they think this. Things were really awful in really existing capitalism which is great news for them because it means that the Bank of England, the Central Bank of the United Kingdom, is going to start printing even more money to give to them. Why shouldn't they be happy? Because they know they will, that, that people of their ilk will take the Central Bank money, the additional Central Bank money, take it to the London Stock Exchange and buy their own shares. So they think, okay, excellent opportunity to, to buy. This decoupling of financial wealth creation from capitalism and capitalist profits that means the end of capitalism from where, where, where I'm standing. And also, if you add to that the new technologies, uh, the digital technologies, and you mentioned the, the biotech technologies as well, but the digital ones are very big at this moment. Why? Not only, I mean, you know, Pfizer and um, Moderna and so on, uh, they, they now have immense power over society because they are producing the stuff which saves lives. Uh, but there is an even more grotesque power by you know, digital platforms like Amazon. The moment you enter Amazon, you exit capitalism. It is as if you've stepped out onto the street of your town, the you know, commercial road of your town, whichever town you, uh, you happen to be living in, High Street, as the English would say, or Main Street in America. And suddenly, if you look around, it is as if you're in a science fiction movie, and you realize that every building, every shop, every house uh, is owned by one person that whatever is being or, um, offered to you to purchase um, has not been produced by that one person, but it is being controlled by the one per that one person. It's sold to you by that one person who de de determines what you can see, what you can buy, at what price you can buy it. The air you breathe, the tarmac on which you walk, the, the, the bench on which you sit to take a rest, they all belong to that one person. You know, there used to be a word for that. It, was, it used to be called feudalism. This is why I'm saying that since 2008, we live in a techno-feudal world. Now, this techno-feudal world is exceptionally fragile and unstable. And the greatest threat to the many, to the demos, is that they will mistake this ironclad-looking system as a powerful, solid system, which it is not. The power of the Jeff Bezos of the world, of the Zuckerbergs, of the owners of Pfizer and so on, 
is the false belief in the mind of the many that they are powerless as individuals. What we need to do to bring the demos back into democracy is at the international level to you know, let people into a very large secret. Things could be otherwise, as David Greber used to say, that they have the power. Well, uh, on that inspiring uh, final sentence, uh, we either enthused enough people or made them angry enough but there's a lot of questions. So I think we'll, uh, Yanis, we'll go to the audience. Uh, thank you so much for this. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and learned so much of it. Of course, we, as I say, we just scratch uh, uh, the surface um, to try and unpack the world uh, we live in uh, uh, from a political economic uh, point of view and, and moral uh, point of view. So um, I'm handing back the, uh, the floor to, to whom, Katie? Me. To, to, to Kali. Kali. Hello. Hi. Thank you both. Thank you for that. Um, I wish it could go on, but it would be good to bring in our audience and hear what they have to say. Um, we had nine questions linked to Palestine, and they were pointing to the role of the EU, the rise of anti-BDS legislation, the sale of the Kalamata airport to Elbit, systems, the Greek parliament, links between Palestine and Kashmir. So we tried to cluster them and I'm gonna read a question. So thank you to everybody who did put those questions in. Um, we've tried to bring them together into one question to both our speakers. And it is, in the current moment, what is the most effective way of supporting Palestinians and Palestinian resistance? And what do you think of political strategies of the left in the EU towards Palestine today? Thank you. Since, you, since uh, the beginning of the sentence was in the current moment, can you allow me to uh, give you some breaking news? As, as I speak now, as we speak, um, less than a kilometer from where I am, the uh, Athens police, the Greek police, unleashed uh, a massive um, attack, assault, on uh, young people, including members of our party, who have been demonstrating support of Palestine. I just felt the need to state that as a news flash, if you want. So what we need to do is a lot more of that. And I think that, and this is, you know, look, we all know what we need to do. We need to go out there and make it impossible for the silence to prevail. That's our number one duty. If we do that, then everything else is going to follow. The greatest uh, support and an ally of Netanyahu and apartheid in, in Israel and the Palestinian lands is silence. So we need to break that silence. There's no doubt about that. Beyond that, there's nothing more to say. Um, I truly believe that the rest is going to follow. Uh, but here I, I, I need Ilan's uh, um, counsel and advice. Ilan, I have a question for you on this issue because I don't know what the, the, the answer is. And I'm asking you now as a party leader, because I need to go into the parliament and also to our party congress, which is happening next month. Um, and we are going to be discussing Palestine and what our party should be doing regarding that. Now, I, ever since I read Edward Said a long time ago uh, and his opposition to the Oslo Accords um, and his view that uh, it's now too late for a two-state solution and we need a single-state solution. I believe that. I think that he's right. Um, this is a civil rights issue. Uh, you, you know, as a European, I, I, I want a democratic federation of Europeans. I don't want borders. Uh, and in a place as tight, geographically tight, as Palestine, uh, to me, it seems very difficult to imagine two states that are worth having. I mean, you could, we could create two states, but I'm not sure they would be progressive states, um, freedom-loving and democratic states. So do I propose to our party Congress uh, on the 4th, 5th of June that we support a single um, non-religious uh, uh, secular state in Palestine? Because I have, you know, Palestinian comrades here in Greece who say, but you don't want to extinguish our aspirations for a Palestinian state. 
I need your, your, your advice on this, Ilan. Uh, you, you're right. It's, it's, it's a conundrum because on the one hand, those who are representing the Palestinian people, whether it's the PA or Palestinian members of Knesset in Israel, or officials who are still connected to the PLO, still support the two-state solution. On the other hand, uh, you're, you know, five minutes on the ground, it's very easy to analyze and to see that this is not going to work, not just because of uh, additional to what you have said, because also this was never a solution that really dealt with the main issue in Palestine, which was the Zionist ideology, the colonization of Palestine. Two states never offered decolonization of Palestine. And we need, as much as it sounds like an anachronistic term in the 21st century, but we need to decolonize uh, the whole of historical Palestine, also in a way that would allow the refugees uh, to return and to build uh, an equitable uh, and democratic society uh, for all. I, I understand the, 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 the difficulty of taking a position which is not yet taken by, by the PLO. Um, on the other hand, there is uh, a pace of destruction on the ground. A and there is a, a disconnect between many of the institutions that used to represent faithfully the Palestinian people, like the PLO and the civil society. That I think it could be uh, really uh, a very positive contribution uh, if you articulate a support uh, uh, for this idea, uh, and and uh, this could be, uh, I think, really a, a landmark uh, in the way international politics uh, interact with the realities uh, in Palestine. Probably a, uh, a alternative or option B for this is at least to adopt the three points that the BDS movement has put forward, which is to stress that we are asking for sanctions and boycott in order to respect the rights of the Palestinians in the West Bank uh, not to live under uh, occupation and the uh, right of the Palestinians in Gaza not to live under siege the right of the Palestinians inside Israel not to live under an apartheid system and the right of the refugees uh, to return. Because I think that if you take the three rights together, it is another way of supporting uh, uh, the one state uh, uh, solution. But, um, you know, I'm part of a, a movement on the ground for the one democratic state. What we are doing, we engage intensively now with all the people who are representing the Palestinians uh, whether in Ramallah or inside or in Gaza or in the refugee camps, we really would love to see uh, the Palestinian national movement galvanized behind the idea of a one-state solution, uh, which will make it easier for, for, people like your, for, for people like you and your party, of course, to support it. But I do think that articulated in the right way, this is something that would have a positive influence on the discourse on the future of Palestine, on the reality of Palestine, uh, and would include all the Palestinians and the whole of Palestine in our discussion. Because what the two-state solution does, it reduces the Palestinians to those who live in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and it reduces Palestine to 22% of historical Palestine. And I think any discourse that uh, is relevant to the whole of Palestine and to all of the Palestinians uh, is very welcome uh, uh, support and, and contribution, I think, to the discussion. Okay, uh, we have our next question, uh, which is uh, coming from uh, Abed uh, Khawaja from on Zoom. Uh, and Abed is asking uh, a question to Yanis around uh, the way that uh, uh, university economics is taught. Uh, he notes that Professor Richard Wolff uh, once commented uh, on his own education, economics education in, in the United States and, and said that the top universities, basically the economics education is extremely politicized um, and you have students graduating from these institutions who have never studied Marx. Um, and uh, Abbott's question is, uh, how can, is it possible to ever fix this problem? <laughs> it's well worse than that. Far, far worse than that. I remember, um, what, seven or eight years ago, 
I was an um, uh, external examiner at the University of Cambridge in one of the colleges, I won't mention which. And um, you know, my job was to assess the quality of education that uh, those great undergraduates received in economics. And I was aghast to find out that the University of Cambridge, the answer to the question that I put to the students, which was a ridiculous question, uh, how many of you have read any Keynes? Zero. Graduates of economics from the University of Cambridge, Keynes's University. Marx, Keynes, they haven't read of. They don't read anything. And you know what? Even the new members of staff, I, you know, the, the people who swear in the name of um, you know, Kenneth Arrow, of Gerard de Breu, the greats of their own economics. I doubt they've read Arrow or de Breu ever. You know, now they do, you know, we are in, 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 a, in an academia, in an economics academia, uh, that um, punishes people from, for writing books and for reading books. Uh, I remember I was actually applying for a job many years ago. Um, and I was told that uh, my CV is very good and they wanted to give me the job, but can we take the books out that I've written from my CV? I said, what? And they said, well, because you see, you know, there will be people on the committee who will consider all this time you spent on writing books as being out of focus. And the focus that they wanted was articles. Uh, so they read articles and then they reproduce them and they write, uh, they write articles. And it's all a self-referential, pointless merry-go-round. So, you know, it's, 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 it's an intellectual free zone, economics departments these days. If people are intellectuals, they are being intellectuals, despite of their economics, academics, economics um, uh, position. And let me give you another um, piece of information that you may not have. All those fantastic mathematical economists that got the Nobel Prizes. You know, if you, if you go to anybody, any financial engineer in Goldman Sachs, and you say, okay, mate, now, what is your model of the world of capitalism? They will say, are you the bre? This is what they will say if they, if they are schooled at all, if they know anything about economic theory. Their own economic theory, the mainstream, you know, liberal establishment economic theory, they will mention Aro and Debre. Now, what they will not tell you, because they don't know it, is that Kenneth Arrow denounced anyone who uses his models in order to explain capitalism and to do policy on that. I remember Kenneth Arrow, you know, that great doyen of the establishment of academic economics. In a, in a seminar in 1991 at the University of New York, NYU, it was a small seminar room. Uh, Ken came in and presented one of his mathematical models extremely complicated, wonderful man, fantastic presentation, aesthetically the mathematics on the board were beautiful, right? So he goes on from one equation to the other. And there is one of the younger professors from NYU and says, uh, uh, Professor, uh, equation 3A dashed uh, makes me think that perhaps when we are taxing business, we should be taxing using this tax system rather than that tax system. And Ken stops and looks at him and he says, my dear young man, or something like he was quite condescending. He said, you're confusing that which is useful with that which is interesting. This is interesting. It is not useful. If you try to apply it, you're going to do a lot of damage to a lot of people. So, you know, it's like the Pope not believing, not being faithful, right? But going through the motions. And then coming out even and saying, look, I don't believe there is a God, right? But the second-rate cardinals being exceptionally polemic and, you know, Spanish Inquisition-like believers. This is the, 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 the tragedy in economics. Now, the additional tragedy for students of economics is that, especially in Britain, I hope that um, this is not the case in Exeter. I'm sure it is not the case at Exeter University, right? Um, but I, it is definitely the case in places like the LSE. Uh, they buy CVs. They cannot compete with Harvard and Yale uh, for the publication record of professors. They cannot give the same salaries. 
So what they do is they say to somebody with a very good CV from the perspective of mainstream economics uh, uh, academia, um, you know, here's a full-time salary. You, you don't have to be here for more than three weeks a, month, a year. So the students never get taught by the person who's actually come up with the theory, who usually doesn't, because they're smart people, they don't believe in, in the theory, is applicability to really exist in capitalism. So they end up with uh, um, a precariat lecturer, somebody who has been teaching 30 hours a day and goes through the motions of teaching the stuff, and you know, who won't get tenure and who is in a proletarian in the university system. That is how academic economics operates today, and it is a damn shame. Yeah, we're ready to move to the next question. Okay, I guess this will be our closing question then. Um, so maybe a quick note from the both of you. The question, there's two questions on the pandemic. pandemic. Uh, one from Noor K and the other from Zahar Yanovici, both on YouTube. And they ask, does the pandemic and vaccine nationalism facilitate a huge transfer of wealth from the poor to the wealthy? If so, how can we go about reversing it? And what can be done to address the type of structural problems that disadvantage countries less capable to secure vaccines um, or to, for them to argue effectively in the World Trade Organization or European Economic Zone? Well, I'll, be very, I'll give you a brief answer to this. Uh, on the first, yes, absolutely. Every crisis of capitalism increases inequalities, and this one has uh, turbocharged them. There is no doubt about that. The precariat has become more precarious. The rich, through the process that I described before, through the money printed by the central banks, you know, they are, they are just they are becoming obscenely wealthier uh, in their sleep, as it. You know, not a result of innovation of doing something clever. They are just sleeping there, and suddenly, you know, billions and billions are added to their wealth. This, this, this is a fact. What do we do about that? Well, the first step should be, uh, I mentioned that before, imagine if the, I mean, already we've seen a little bit of that with uh, Trump first and Biden uh, more recently giving checks of, you know, dollars, thousands of dollars to individuals. Uh, imagine if we all had a central bank account and suddenly, you know, two thousand uh, dollars or euros or whatever appeared in that bank account, um, without any kind of process of bureaucracy, any kind of you know, just give it to everyone, and then you know the, the the wealthy can be taxed on this at the end of the year. That's something you can do really very quickly if you really care about using the printing presses um, for the many, not the few, as my friend Jeremy Corbyn would say. Right? So this is something really very quick you can do um, regarding vaccines and the developing world. Look, this whole discussion about patents is really very interesting and, and very irrelevant. Because even if uh, the patents were to, I, I mean, I want to see the patents uh, be released. Uh, uh, to go back to what we had in the 1950s with the polio vaccine, uh, whose inventor gave it to humanity as a, as a free good, which is public good, which it should be. But even if today Pfizer and Moderna and AstraZeneca were to give away the patent, you know, a factory, uh, a pharmaceutical factory in India or in South Africa, it would take them 18 months to produce the first vaccine. You know, by that time, thousands will have died unnecessarily. Um, for me, what is absolutely essential is, again, I go back to the fact that if you look at the money that is being printed as we speak by all the central banks, it's just, you know, a million times more than what is necessary in order to pay for the vaccines. You know, if you're printing all this money, well, give it to those multinationals to buy huge quantities of vaccines and spread them around the world. Uh, do it today. Um, because I think that the most revolutionary policy is not one that simply sits back and says another world is possible and expects, you know, the socialist revolution to happen and then afterwards we will solve the problems. The most revolutionary policy is to point out to people out there who are not interested in our visions about socialism and another now and utopia and so on, they, they are struggling to make, to, you know, to survive until the end of the week, yeah, to show to them that within the current circumstance, the current system, you know, the powers that be could actually have a vaccine in their, in their arm tomorrow, uh, without, without socialism even. 
or without even social democracy. Just, you know, they are printing all this money, just pay it and send it to them. Uh, because only when they realized that things could be very different, even today, under the present capitalist techno-feudal system, call it what you may, may, only then will they revolt. Uh, I know that we are running out of time, Kadi, and you said this is the last question, so maybe I will just end by again mentioning Palestine in this connection, and I think part of what we discussed today, Yanis, is about the ethical dimension when we talk about uh, uh, biofeudalism or techno-feudalism uh, and the, the way the pandemic uh, has exasperated existing uh, disparities in society. It's good to, to remind us that, uh, that another kind of very ugly uh, uh, aspect of this whole uh, uh, crisis when it comes to Palestine is the way that Israel is using the question of vaccine in order to impose another kind of oppression on the Palestinian, either withholding it or not giving it or creating uh, uh, a link between getting it and so-called good Palestinian uh, behavior is a call another callous aspect uh, that uh, uh, we should remember even if today we are and rightly are grieving for the attacks on Gaza uh, on Jerusalem and so on. Uh, the kind of uh, uh, techno-feudalism that Yanis is talking about uh, is supporting the oppression of the Palestinians and that's why we need to work together, political economists, historians and activists to expose the full picture uh, how the global economic system and the particular oppression of the Palestinians go hand in hand and therefore uh, uh, Yanis, your initiative with Barney, Sanders and so on shows that only a global solidarity uh, uh, really movement will tip the balance uh, uh, in places such as Palestine and beyond. And I hope we, we will all be able to contribute in our way to such a, a, an international, uh, what I called antidote or a, a, an alliance that challenges the kind of alliance that makes our life miserable, impossible, uh, and oppressive, and believe in our power uh, to change that reality. Uh, thank you, uh, Yanis, uh, for taking the time. Uh, and thank you, uh, everyone else. Uh, I would leave it to uh, uh, Kali to uh, conclude the meeting. And uh, thank you again.